let's transition, gentlemen, from the last panel into this one by starting with federal health reform, which we did just talk about. Uh, talk to me a little bit about what's next for Texas. Talk to me about, you know, we've heard Perry say that Medicaid, he compared it to the Titanic last night. You know, he said Texas will not expand Medicaid. He does, he, you know, he's basically what we've heard about uh, uh, a healthcare compact and some different discussion going that way. Tell me a little bit about where you all stand, where you see the future of Medicaid and federal health reform in Texas in, in the next year or two. I'm going to get out of the habit of turning to Chris to answer every single question. I should point out, I was um, Chris remaining at the uh, commission was sort of a, um, a must-have on my part. Chris, in his long years with the agency, understands this. He was here when they did the health, uh, health reform from House Bill 2292 in, in 2003. And so... Um, I, I sort of look at it like sometimes he'll drive and I'll, I'll navigate, sometimes the other way around. But at the end of the day, his institutional knowledge of where we are sort of frees me up to think about where we're going to go next. So if you don't mind, I'll take the first swing at it. Um, when you and I first spoke after the appointment was announced, I said um, um, something to the effect that the things are so dramatically um, off kilter right now. That the, what, what what we face in Texas is almost not a problem. It's almost an opportunity, in the in in that we we don't have the choice of doing nothing. We have to do something differently. Um, eventually, the American statesman quoted you quoting me as saying, "Obamacare is not a problem. It's an opportunity. It's not quite that simple." It presents opportunities for us, and we will continue to work with the federal government to see if we can get more latitude. I think the governor's um, argument is right on, which is that it is like the t Titanic, and if you make course corrections now, you may not suffer the same fate. So I agree with him completely on that point. Anyone can look at that cost curve and say it's just unsustainable until you start to raise taxes, which may hurt the economy, or unless you shift money from education and other vital um, necessary programs. And it's getting to where education and health care in the state chew up so much of the budget that, it, that there's the natural conflict at the end of the day. So what, what we're going to try and do is change the course in some areas a little bit, in some areas very dramatically. If, if I leave this office eventually, I want all that I would ask is that people look and say, now he challenged every assumption. You give me an assumption about health and human services, the way we currently deliver services, or what the future is going to be like, and I want to challenge that assumption. Sometimes I'll be wrong, the assumption will be correct, but I want to challenge every one of them. And I'll start with a few when you're ready for me to do some of that. So, right. Well, I'm going to try to pin you down on one thing a little bit, and that is, you know, Medicaid expansion. Do you think at the end of the day Texas will not accept this, you know, estimated $100 billion, or do you think there's going to be some wiggle room with the Obama administration, you know, that Perry may be able to find a solution that's amenable to him, that's amenable to you to accept some of that money? The governor um, needs to keep a message simple, and I think he's doing exactly the right thing, is tell the federal government we don't, we will not expand Medicaid. I think when you dig below the surface a little bit, what the governor seems to be talking about is Medicaid as we know it. We can't continue that cost escalation. We just cannot continue it. And so um, if, if we can get some latitude from the federal government, then I'd like to take that back to the governor, who I consider to be my boss. Uh, I'm unelected. I'm not a statewide elected official. And so I'm appointed, which means somebody better be my boss. People go, well, you should be acting independently, not with the governor's office. Do you, and I would ask, do you really want somebody not elected running a $30 billion agency with 55,000 employees? You might want to think carefully about that answer. I consider the governor to be my boss. I want to go to him and say, the feds have given us a little bit of latitude. And because of that latitude, it would let me change the direction of Medicaid and CHIP in a certain fashion. Is that enough latitude for us to now press forward? At the end of the day, as you put it, if we could, if we could increase the number of people who receive state services, although it's certainly not Medicaid as we know it, then maybe we can do that. The governor has given me a little bit of latitude to get out there and try some things. And if they become untenable or they just wouldn't work or they're too expensive, then I'll hear about it from his office. Do either of you believe, your former Medicaid director, do either of you believe, like the governor said, that Medicaid is, the Titanic is a sinking ship? I, I believe, 
Okay. Well, first, you have to understand, I mean, the Texas Medical Association released a survey of their members within the last uh, month or so that said only 31% of them are accepting Medicaid now. New, new Medicaid. New Medicaid. Uh, and uh, it, as opposed to maybe 60% back about, you know, 10 or 12 years ago. So, so why is that? Uh, we've increased reimbursement rates significantly during that time. Uh, we've done a lot of things in Medicaid, so, so what, what, what prevents us uh, from uh, having people that are enrolled in Medicaid from accessing primary care? I think the answer to that is, you know, is, is, is pretty clear. I mean, the Medicaid system as it stands now uh, is not sustainable either uh, administratively, and it's not sustainable in the sense that uh, with the uh, increases in expenditures that we have uh, throughout the program. Uh, and that, uh, as Dr. Janik said, he's, he's going to be beginning to challenge every single assumption that we have. If we do not begin to look at Medicaid in a different way other than just expanding it to a large number of people, uh, then the system itself can never, can never ever be sustainable. Uh, we got um, you know, 3.6 million people enrolled in Medicaid and we want to enroll another 2.3 million in a system where only 31% of the doctors accept new Medicaid. I, I, I don't know how um, we could legitimately look uh, our state policymakers in the face and say that's a good idea. Let's transition a little bit into the costs of Medicaid in Texas. I'm curious how you all feel about how lawmakers funded or underfunded Medicaid in the last legislative session. You know, obviously there was a lot of emphasis on, on finding cuts, finding cost savings, increasing Medicaid fraud detection. How are we going into this session? How underfunded, if you will, are we? And, you know, what are we going to do to meet the Medicaid budget in the next session? The immediate shortfall when the lawmakers come back, our prediction has been for some months, and I think it will hold hold true, is that we're about on the Medicaid acute side, $3.8 billion. In the hole? In a shortfall. And what that means is that the services, um, we, services that have been delivered, caseloads go up, and have, things have changed since the legislature was last in town. And so when they come back, we say we delivered the services as the law and the policy require, and so that cost of what's been done since you last left town, um, based on assumptions that were made at the time, is $3.8 billion plus another $900 million, close to a billion dollars over in Department of Aging and Disability Services. So that total that they'll be faced with is $4.7 billion. Now, you need to add on to that, as most folks know, they didn't fund the last months of the biennium for health and human services, and so we, we will ask for some of that funding to be there in place. You're uh, going to ask for that funding ahead of the session or in, you know, a bit at the beginning of the session? It's not that they can give it ahead of the session, but we're letting the policymakers know now what that total is going to be. And, the, and most of them know, this is no secret, but we will run out of cash in Health and Human Services Commission sometime around March or so. We could delay payments and do some things and push it off till April. Uh, Department of Aging and Disability Services would run out in February or Fe March. February or March. Yeah. Um, if we want, and that, that's assuming we can move some money around, we get budget authority to move some money around within service. And so considering that, that money was obviously left in the rainy day fund, you know, coming into this session, was that the right call? That is a that is a policy decision that I don't get to weigh on anymore. I, I, I love that sort of thing, and the temptation for me to revert to my old self will always be there. That's not we my do job. You have a former lawmaker on the stage. My job, <laughs> my job is, my job is to is to carry out the mission of HHSC with the tools that I'm handed to do the very best job that we can by challenging all those assumptions. You know, we're looking at a situation where we're um, trying to encourage doctors to accept Medicaid patients, uh, and more and more of them are not accepting Medicaid patients, and we're also looking at probably another tight budget year. Um, what is your expectation for provider rates going forward? What's your expectation for where, you know, where is there going to be some give? Where are there going to be going to have to be more cuts or savings in these programs? Okay. Go ahead. Okay. You, you know, it, it, if you look at the Medicaid program broadly, um, we have about 25% of the people enrolled in the program use, utilize 60% of the assets or the money. Uh, and when we look at Medicaid and you, and you look at that and you, and you say, well, that is the age-blind disabled population. Okay? And intuitively, people believe that's long-term care, but the majority of the funds expended on that population is not long-term care, it's acute care services. So what that does is <clears throat> it presents us with a very good opportunity to look at that linkages between providing appropriate long-term services and supports in a way that reduces 
those acute care expenditures. For example, um, AARP sponsoring this, this session. Uh, AARP issued a scorecard uh, last year, or maybe it was the year before. My years tend to run together, but uh, I live in two-year cycles. But the, uh, uh, th they issued a scorecard that said Texas has one of, the, one of the highest return rates from the nursing home into inpatient hospital stays. Those are extraordinarily expensive stays. Uh, if we can come up with strategies uh, to work to reduce those inpatient hospital stays, reduce the uh, uh, incident of emergency department utilization by the, by the population that uh, is that age-blind disabled population, that gives us the opportunity to make innovations not just in the long-term care system, but throughout the Medicaid system as a whole. I'm curious, I want to talk a, a couple minutes about Medicaid fraud. There's been a huge increase in Medicaid fraud investigations. It was a huge subject in the last legislative session. Talk about finding savings. You know, doctors who were using the Medicaid program as an ATM. We've also heard a lot of doctors crying foul, saying this is just, you know, a crazy witch hunt that they're having their funding cut off for months while these investigations are going on. Uh, do you believe um, Texas has taken, you know, too hard of a course on these doctors? Do you believe Medicaid fraud, that there are huge savings to be found there? Uh, now this is where I get to revert to my old po politician days. The answer is yes to both. Um, on the one hand, what we, we have to develop a system for treating everyone the same and investigating fraud, waste, and abuse. Everybody's got to be treated the same. We can't single out somebody and say, we're going to have a different process for you because of, because of where you live or whatever. We just have to, the process needs to be the same for everyone. So having said that, what we want is a system that detects fraud, waste, and abuse early, and it may be something nefarious, intentional overuse, intentional um, fraud, or it may be something a whole lot simpler like coding errors. And, and if someone codes um, a certain bill a particular way and they don't know that's not the correct way to code it, well, they're going to keep doing that over and over and over. We need to detect those patterns and those outliers a lot sooner, and we can do that actually with some technology. We, we, I don't, I'm not one of those folks who believe technology cures everything. I was one of the last people I noticed switch from a wooden tennis racket to a metal racket because I said I'm not that good with a wooden one. But once you do decide that you're going to employ a technology solution to something, it's amazing the things that it can help you with. So, so looking at patterns of uh, prescribing or patterns of reimbursement and so forth, we can detect problems early. We're blessed with a terrific inspector general. Doug Wilson is a good man. Doug Wilson is not out there to hit every doctor for a $100 coding error. That's not the game. The game is to let the doctor know if we find coding errors and say you're coding different than just 90% of the population, 90% of your peers do. We, we detect something and we want to talk to you about that. Give them an early heads up, correct it, no harm, no foul, it's all going to be fine. But we are going to use those same techniques to focus on that widespread abuse. Uh, orthodontia got a great deal of play, and rightly so. We have too many providers who are providing braces for kids in the Medicaid program who were unable, when you go back and do an inspection, who were unable to say, yes, here's the molds that I took of this kid's teeth before I put braces on. And, and I don't have the x-rays, the dog ate the x-rays. I mean, just, just widespread numbers of people who were putting braces on kids and you can't substantiate that they met the, a very definitive scoring system. It's not, it was not subjective, really. There's a scoring system as to what would qualify for needing orthodontic work. And a bunch of them say, oh, look at now, the kid's so much better. Well, that sounds right, except we don't know what the kid looked like before. So we want a system that is fair to the providers just in terms of we'll inspect a pattern we may do a random audit at some point, but when we do that, we're going to adjudicate it quickly. We don't want something dragging out for 10 months. We want things figured out, and I think our goal over an OIG is probably something like, you know, six to eight weeks at the most. And I think we, I think we can get there. He's asked for 100 new FTEs, Doug has, over in the OIG, and while they're technically separate from me, we will continue to work together so that when they see patterns, they give me an alert. And remember, I'm sorry, one more thing. The Office of Inspector General doesn't just look for patterns from the outside, meaning from the providers. The OIG also looks for things that could be taking place inside, and so in that, he really is in, in, independent from me. So if he found out that I was stealing paper clips from the office or something, then, then I don't get to know about that. He could, in, he could investigate me. So. Okay. 
As we talk about, you know, finding cost savings, this uh, is a good transition to the women's health program and family planning issues in Texas. Obviously, the, the LBB has said, you know, pretty clearly that their calculations show that the family planning uh, funding cuts of the last legislative session are going to end up costing Texas a ton of money. You know, more than 50 percent of births right now in the state are Medicaid births. Do you feel like the cuts were the right call, the right place to find cuts? Uh, and you know, what are we going to do sort of going forward? Are you expecting to see more Medicaid births as a result? Um, so that's, let, let me start. That'll be a great first assumption to challenge. Actually, the numbers we have from the LBB are that the, the new Texas Women's Health Program will actually save money the same way that the current program saves money. And that include the family provide, planning cuts of the last session. That's great. If you, provide, if you provide the services, and, and avoid births that would end up on Medicaid for, for women or families who don't or are not ready to start a family yet, then those savings are still there. So I, I'm confident what we, our challenge is to make sure that we've got that good broad network of providers who are ready to provide these services to the 106,000 women, I think was the number in 2011, uh, who want, need, and depend on those services. So we're busy getting a robust network together and making sure that our rules will allow for a robust network and, and uh, actively recruiting the docs who want to be in there. And I know much of this ends up being aimed, this, this, the fight that takes place ends up uh, being aimed at a couple of groups. And, but we want everybody to work together as we transition from the old program to the new program. We want all the providers to be aware of what the new program will do, and we want those old providers to say, I'm not going to be part of this new program because of things that I do, and, but however, I'm not going to just cast you aside. I'm going to make sure that we work together with the state to find you a provider who will provide the services. And it's not just about family planning. It's about cervical cancer screening and, and mammography for breast cancer. I mean, we want it to be a very robust program that encompasses all those women health healthcare needs. Right. And obviously, to read between the lines, we're talking about the women's health program here and uh, Planned Parenthood in particular. Um, but going beyond the women's health program, which is now a Texas-based program as opposed to a, a Medicaid and federally funded program, um, you know, family planning was cut by two thirds in the last legislative session. Programs under under dishes, title programs, you know, clearly there are going to be more women who are not going to be receiving those services. I'm Again, I, the legislature cut funds for certain things, and we deal with the tools that we're given, but we think that we believe that the funding is there for a robust program, and our job is to institute a robust program, make sure there's enough providers so that women who need those services get those services. That's what we're working towards. What does the future look like for Medicaid in Texas, for Medicare in Texas? Obviously, we've seen lots of talk nationally about a health care compact as you know, a possibility, people seeking you know, block grant funding to run Medicaid. Um, obviously, there's been lots of talk on the campaign trail about Medicare, whether it's possible that Medicare could someday become a you know, quote unquote voucher program. Where do you all see the future of Texas in those two um, safety net programs? Go ahead, but I have strong. Okay. The the uh, and, and kind of go to where the we have a system uh, where people that are enrolled in Medicare and Medicaid have two different programs in which they access services in this state. It's called the duly eligible population, and uh, for whatever reason, the federal government has has continued over the years to perpetuate the separation of those two programs. I think that's been extraordinarily unfortunate, both for the quality of health services for people that are duly eligible, and also for the taxpayer who has to pay for an extraordinarily inefficient program. Uh, what we've done in, this, in, in the last year is we've asked our federal partners to allow us uh, to conduct a pilot where we integrate uh, Medicare and Medicaid services into one, uh, one pilot. Uh, we believe that by doing that, uh, we'll be able to provide a much better quality of life and quality of care while also containing uh, an extraordinary amount of costs that result from two programs that benefit from pushing cost off to each other. Uh, and so we, we're hopeful uh, that our federal partners will allow us to do that. Uh, it, it's, uh, it, it's been amazing that uh, both programs have operated uh, uh, completely separate for almost half a century. Uh, and it's uh, and hopefully we'll be able to to move forward with some new programs in the future that integrate both of those. A couple of points. Um, if, 
it, to go back to what Commissioner Trailer said earlier, a, a large amount of the recipients, the, the, the patient population, is made up of non-disabled children, although the expenses come for the aged and disabled. That becomes, so we have to look at a way to deliver services to the disabled in ways that keep their acute care costs down. We do have difficulties with retaining good patient care attendance. My mom is not in a nursing home. My mom is home with dad, and yet she is, uh, she's completely disabled. She barely communicates, but she's getting good care because we have good people who are able to come in and, and, and help dad, dad's 85 now, uh, help dad care for mom. And the point is, we can see, I know the difference that good care makes. And so what we need to do is come up with a new system to help deliver that care to those folks who aren't necessarily acutely sick. They're chron they have a chronic disability, maybe paraplegia or some other reason, but they're, they're chronically um, uh, disabled. And yet, if you can give them good care, you'll keep the acute spikes coming up. You won't get the bed sores, you won't get the pneumonias, you won't get the, all the other things that become so expensive. Secondly, I want to I want to go back to challenging an assumption for a minute, and I know it gets, this gets great play, is that Texas is um, leads the nation in the percent of people who are uninsured. And that's based on the American Community Survey, and basically it asks this question. At, face to face, by telephone, however the survey is carried out, it asks the question, do you have insurance right now, today? And when that question is answered, we sort of shoot to the top. And what, if you're the person answering that survey, you look in your wallet and you, no, I don't have insurance. There is no insurance card in my wallet. And yet it leaves Texans with the impression that there is no safety net. If Harris County Hospital District and Parkland Hospital, Tarrant County Hospital District, Bear County Hospital District tomorrow created a card and put it in the wallet of all those people who come to their hospital districts for services and said, this is your insurance card, you would see a dramatically different answer to that question. But that care is uncompensated, it is, it isn't is it? Absolutely not. It is purely compensated because all of those entities assess taxes that pays for that care. Uncompensated means that nobody ever pays for the bill and a bunch of those bills in fact are paid all i'm saying it wouldn't go away completely but what you see is a dramatically different number only by virtue of the fact that that hospital district gave that person a card i think i'm on pretty solid ground here with three and a half million people uh let's say living in in in, in harris county and and you look at statewide the number of people who and that's the population Harris County plus but a bunch of those folks go to the Harris County Hospital District and the people of Harris County have raised property taxes on themselves to help cover that uncompensated care so number one there is a system a partnership if you will sometimes a reluctant partnership but a partnership nonetheless where in local hospital districts paid for some of that uncompensated care with property taxes so somebody's getting paid Okay, but so are you arguing that someone who shows up in an emergency room there and they don't have health insurance, that that's basically effectively the same as being no, insured? No, absolutely not. That's not what I said. What I said is the care is being delivered. They're getting cared and, and, and this is important, you have to go to Harris County Hospital District and ride around. I'd love to do it with you sometime because what you're going to see is that those people who go to the emergency room frequently because there's not a clinic that's open at the appropriate hours. And they may go to the Harris County Hospital District ER, they may go to a local ER. But the point is, there's not a clinic that's open after they get through working that double shift and now it's 11.30 at night. So they need, they need a place to go where the more routine care can be delivered. Secondly, the reason care delivered in the ER is expensive for a couple of reasons. The first is that when you get there, more than likely you're going for something pretty serious. If you've got the sniffles, a lot of people, unless they just don't have somewhere else to go, don't go to the emergency room for the sniffles. That's a less expensive, easier to treat. Most folks will wait. So you end up with a concentration of the more acute services needed. But the second reason that that is expensive is because when a patient shows up in the emergency room, even for something fairly routine, you don't have a medical record for them. This is not their medical home. And so the doctors and nurses in the emergency room will treat that as, which it is, that, that's a brand new patient. And so you're not quite sure 
you know they've got diabetes, but you're not quite sure how well they've been good, how how well they've been controlling their diabetes and checking their blood sugar. So you've got a doctor treating a patient that she doesn't know, and so you're tempted to then do a more extensive battery of tests. And so it is more expensive. And yet when you go to Harris County Hospital District, it's not just the ER. You will see that there are clinics. And men, women, children go to the clinics. They have follow-up visits. It becomes their medical home outside of the emergency room. So to some extent, they do have a medical home. And I'm, I'm not going to tell you that this system is perfect. But I want to sort of help dispel that myth that just because somebody doesn't have insurance means they don't get anything except through the emergency room. It's simply not true. So then what percentage of the Texas population would you, if you think it's not really that quarter of the population, what percent of the population would you classify as truly having no safety net, being uninsured? Yeah. If, if, if you want that to be today, that's the other part of the assumption that we have to challenge. That's a snapshot. Who doesn't have insurance today? Um, to say that I did not eat a hamburger today does not mean I never eat hamburgers. I won't have one tomorrow. I won't have one the day after that. And so you can't say we've got this huge population of people who never eat hamburgers. It's just not the same. It's a statistical method. It's got to be done somehow. And you can either look and say who's got insurance today, who's had insurance for the past year, which gives you a different skewed number. It may not tell you they, everybody had insurance last year and nobody's got it today. It's a very different situation. And there's no way to predict who will have it tomorrow. I'm giving you a long answer to a fairly short question. I don't know what that absolute number is. It depends on how you measure it. My job as the Executive Commissioner of Health and Human Services is to make sure that we maintain that safety net and that we work with the county hospital districts and then we work with those counties that don't have a hospital district to make sure that that safety net is there. Remember, for that uncompensated care that was given, quote, uncompensated care that was given. We also have another program called Disproportionate Share Hospital or DISH funding. And what that means is that these hospital districts put up their money. I think uh, former Commissioner Sees alluded to this in the last meeting. They put up their tax money to show it to the federal government. Federal government gives a match for that. It comes back. They get their tax money back. And then the state apportions that match money through hospitals around the state hundreds of hospitals, a couple hundred hospitals around the state. And so it was uncompensated, meaning that person didn't have private insurance, but it was compensated, one, either because it was paid for with the generosity of those folks that live in a county taxing themselves, or importantly, dish money followed that. And then I can, I, we could go on about this for a long time about uncompensated care, the new uncompensated care fund through the um, Affordable Care Act and also a new one called the DISRIP. They may have talked about that last hour, but the DISRIP, the Delivery System Reform Incentive Payment to give the states um, money to, from the federal government to say, go try something new. We have, listen to this, and I, I love this. If you think about what managed care is, managed care network is nothing that more than a group of providers doctors, nurses, uh, physical therapists, social workers, administration. A network is a group of people who are adept at delivering care and saying, we're going to pay you for that group of people that you're going to cover, and then we want you to cover them. And you'll be back next session, and we'll argue about how much you need to carry out that mission for the next two years. But we have 10 of the most terrific managed care networks in this state. I love United. I love Blue Cross. I love Cigna. They, they all help take care of us and pay the bills. But we are ignoring, in my opinion, our state-supported medical schools. And when you think about the administrative oversight that they've got, and when you think about they've got neurosurgeons, and they've got cardiologists, and they've got social workers, and they've got physical therapists, they've got everything that an adequate, robust network needs, and the state funds them with straight general revenue. Instead of saying, we'll take that general revenue, We'll give it to you as a managed care organization, and now we'll get federal match for that. And if you look at where our medical schools are, see if this sounds familiar, because this is where the population is. Houston Galveston, Dallas, Fort Worth, San Antonio, presumably soon to be Austin, Texas Tech up in Lubbock, Texas Tech in El Paso, presumably one day in the Rio Grande Valley. If you look at where those medical schools are and may soon be, it's where the Medicaid population is as well. So I, I want to push this idea a little bit. I don't know that I need statutory authority, but, but I want buy-in from everybody that we treat those state-supported institutions 
wonderful with the cutting edge technologies that they have. Instead of giving them straight GR, let's give them money with a match. And the caveat is this is to take care of people, people in Texas. I love this story, Emily, and I'll shut up in a second. But when I was an intern I at, didn't ask for that. at the University of Texas Medical Branch at Galveston, one night, this gentleman had got in his pickup truck and he drove all night to come to the emergency room at UTMB. And he showed up and he had a problem and, I, and it was semi-emergent. I took care of him and we got him a clinic appointment, you know, coming up and all that. But I, at the end of it, I said, I have to ask you, why did you drive all night to come here from Lubbock to Galveston? You passed hospitals left and right. Why did you come here? He taught me a lesson that night. He looked at me and he's, as if I asked, why do you bother breathing from one moment to the next? He said, this is where we go. He's right. People have come to expect that the medical schools that their tax dollars go to invest in have become a place where they can go. And they know that the hours will be late and there will be some intern that needs to wake up at 1.30 in the morning. Um, but, that, but that somebody is going to be there and somebody will help attend to their needs in an acute situation. And so I think we need to both reward the medical schools for taking care of so-called uncompensated care. We need to compensate them for it. But more than that, we need to foster them to build a network, give them the patience and the money that they need to educate that next generation of doctors and nurses. We've got a severe nursing shortage right now. We've got a doctor shortage looming in the next 10 to 20 years. Helping the medical schools be financially viable and with an adequate patient population to learn from and treat um, will serve Texas better in the long run. Okay, end of sermon. All right, I'm going to transition to Medicare for a second. I want to just ask both of you, first of all, personally, whether you think that Medicare could, could operate, could function as a voucher-style program. And second, as part of the health care compact discussions in the last legislative session, there was a lot of talk about you know, Texas seeking block grants not only for Medicaid, but also for Medicare. Do you believe that HHSC is in a position to run a Texas version of Medicare, if that were ever the case? Okay. Uh, I, I think running a Texas version of Medicare uh, as it exists now would be extraordinarily difficult. Uh, essentially, you'd be asking to overlay uh, Medicare onto the system that we have now. Ha having said that, uh, you ask whether or not a voucher system might be uh, an appropriate way to run that. Well, probably if you're going to promote consumer choice through a voucher system, uh, I, I think it, it, it might very well be a very good alternative to the system that we have now. Uh, particularly, you know, I'd like to focus, always like to focus on the dual population because that's, you know, part of what we serve now. Uh, particularly if it allows us to integrate those two programs uh, in a way that provides better outcomes for people. Uh, the Medicare program now doesn't necessarily provide that. Uh, it, it, it's run in, in very much isolation uh, from the other programs that, that uh, people access for their health care. Uh, a voucher program may very well be uh, a means by which people uh, can intuitively integrate their care. Uh, and if they're a, also a Medicaid enrollee, it may be also the way the state can uh, uh, look at various strategic initiatives uh, to reduce those expensive inpatient hospital stays. You know, when I, when I said that the duly eligible population that most of their costs uh, are in the acute care area, um, keep in mind that most, uh, even w uh, in Medicaid, keep in mind that most of their acute care costs are still in Medicare. So you can, you can almost double or triple that acute care amount uh, that's being expended in Medicare for the acute care services of the age blind disabled population. Um, yeah, I, I think it would give us uh, an extraordinary opportunity to do innovations at the state level. It would be difficult in the short term. And it, for those who don't know, it's a matter of public record. Um, uh, I was actually paid as a lobbyist for the health care compact. Um, I believe in that because I believe the states, every state is different. They have different population makeups, they have different distributions, um, uh, different numbers of medical schools. And so anything that would give a state more opportunity to um, expand its innovation rather than play this mother may I game with the federal government, I think would be a welcome thing. But, but also the compact said amongst the states they could, they could buy back into Medicare if they were not ready yet to implement a system, but, but at least get the ball rolling in that direction. And so it's amazing the things that we can do with the power of, of the, 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 the human resource, the human capital that we have in this state, which has already been a hub for so many great innovations in and out of medicine. 
Um, but we've got to free up people to think that it, there's a chance of them succeeding. If we go, continue with the old system and say, here's the system, go invent some new one if you want, but there's not going to be any funding attached to it. Go and do it and good luck. You're never going to incentivize people to think that they could su succeed at some point. So to challenge the assumption, this is the old one. All we have to do is focus on caseload growth and find adequate dollars and keep doing it the same way we've been doing it. Here's another assumption I like to challenge. Um, people say when you do the same thing over and over again, you know, that's the definition of insanity. Actually, it depends on who you're talking about. If you talk to the batting coach for the New York Yankees, He'll call it practice. It depends on what the situation is. You, some things you want to keep doing the same way, but you fine tune them as you go along. The batting coach for the Yankees, I can't use my Astros very now because they're batting coach, batting, uh, hitting is not very good. Batting coach for the Yankees will take a player and say, your swing is fine, you need to see more pitches, get in there and practice. Do the same thing, but I need you doing it over and over and over. I need you to see 200 pitches today. Somebody else who's got a defective swing, you say, you're doing the same thing over and over again. This is a definition of insanity. I've got to get you out. We've got to fix your swing. So in some instances, we're going to continue doing what we're doing, but we're going to tweak it as we go along. And in some instances, we need wholesale turnover. It's got to be a different direction for certain things. Children's Protective Services. We can talk about Medicaid and CHIP. That's where the money is. But CPS right now? We've got problems, and there are problems that I'll take blame for because back since I was a lawmaker in 1995 when I started, we, we kept thinking, all right, well, let's just try this. We're going to try this. We're going to give all the caseworkers laptops, and, and, and then that'll make their day a little bit more efficient. And then, then this year we're going to focus on the numbers. We'll put more money in for more caseworkers. And then over here, we're going to, next session, we're going to try and put more money into each of those caseworkers. It is time for a fresh approach on how we do this. I don't know what it is. Maybe we need to get out there and, and, and do some very innovative things like crowdsourcing, looking for new answers. But there's, there, there are pockets of people in this, in this state who depend on the state to make sure that the kids in that community are safe. And sometimes we win and sometimes we lose. Sometimes we lose a kid. The kid is hurt or the kid is killed because of abuse in the home. Sometimes we take a, a child away from the parent when maybe she, she didn't really need to be taken away from her parents. What the family needed was more support. It's not that they're abusive or neglectful. It's that they need help with food and bills. That's the mission of Health and Human Services Commission. That is what we are supposed to do. So we can focus on the big dollars and we'll have big battles over that. And I get it. But I also want to keep our focus, Chris's and mine, on those essential services for those families out there that are going to get back on their feet one day. It's not a long-term way of life. They just need a little help to tide them over. That's what we're supposed to do. So how do either of your jobs change with a Romney presidency versus an Obama administration for four more years? Does it change at all? I, I, I think it does. The challenges are still there. The challenges are a state challenge. But I think the responses from the two respective camps would be very different. Um, my job is not to prefer one or the other. My job is to work with the tools that we're given. If, if, if a Romney win means that more money comes to Texas and say, try it the Texas way. Your economy seems to be overall pretty healthy. Try it the Texas way. If the Obama administration gets a second term and they say, here's the new ground rules going forward and we'll start to meet some of the timelines that we've missed so far, then we deal with it. I, I think it'd be very different, one from the other, but my job is to work with the hand that I'm dealt. Yeah, uh, you, you know, absolutely, and hopefully, uh, regardless of, of who wins the election, uh, they'll see the wisdom in giving the state the flexibility to do what we need to do uh, to serve a large number of people in the state. Uh, I have, you know, you, you always hold out uh, hope that, uh, that whoever wins uh, will allow you to operate the program uh, in a way that is, is efficient uh, and has better outcomes for people no matter where they are. You know, I don't want to get in the weeds on the 1115 waiver, some of the waivers that oh, have been granted, but, you know, do you feel like the Obama administration has not been amenable, has not been flexible? You know, the 1115 waiver for a lot of folks was seen as pretty historic. There are those, and I, I don't have, I'll defer to 
Chris to refine my answer. What do they say in Congress? I reserve the right to revise and extend my remarks, meaning my, this is my story and I'm sticking to it, although it may change. Um, I understand we've had, in some instances, in some ways, maybe they were just smaller ways and not as eventful, but we've had as much success with this administration on some waiver requests as we've had in previous Republican administrations. Um, I, I don't know that because I've not been to CMS. I'll wait till I look those folks in the eye and they tell me yes or no in terms of whether they want to trust Texas to come up with a system that fits us better. I had a great meeting a couple of weeks ago with the Undersecretary of Agriculture who's in charge of the SNAP program. And I said, Mr. Secretary, you got to understand, right now a, a, a retail giant, a, a food company, a food store in Texas can't give coupons to a SNAP recipient. Can't, because y'all won't let them. So even though that store may say we want to encourage SNAP recipients, we're going to give them a coupon, federal law says you can't treat them any differently. Can't treat them any differently than you do any other customer. So a food store can't give a coupon to a SNAP mm -hmm. customer. What kind of sense does that make? That is, makes zero sense. He agreed. So I think we'll have some successes with, with CMS. Um, it's a politically charged atmosphere. My hope is I'll get up there before the election to show them that no matter who wins, I still got this job on November the 7th and we got to work together. If the other team wins, terrific. I'm more than happy to work with them. <laughs> you know, and I think it really comes down to, in a lot of ways, uh, there's a statutory construction for the Medicaid program that makes it difficult to uh, implement reforms. So regardless of who is elected, I think that we'll, we will uh, hopefully we'll have some level of reform in that area. If you recall, uh, several years ago, we did have a waiver pending uh, with, uh, with the federal government that would have extended health care to a larger number of people. Yeah. One of the inhibiting factors was, was what the administration at the time believed to be a federal law that would not allow us to offer some level of limited benefit packages to recipients. Uh, I think regardless of whether that was statutory or bureaucratic, uh, I think that was a, an extraordinarily bad mistake uh, for uh, both, uh, the, the, both Congress and our federal partners not to work with us to allow us to do that. That limited benefit package, remember, that sounds like, oh, you're going to cut services, you're going to cut costs. In fact, with the dollars given, limited benefit or changing the benefit package allows us to reach more people. So yes, for some populations, you may not cover that broken arm. However, the goal should be to make sure that that no one gets bankrupt because someone in their family suffers a devastating illness and those bills will wipe them out and they just barely were above the threshold for the FPL that the legislature has set. I mean, that makes no sense. I'd rather cover more people for the more disastrous consequences and say, we expect you to help pull your own weight. We want you to have copays. We want you to have insurance, uh, copays and premium sharing, cost sharing, that sort of thing. But but the state is not going to let you bank go bankrupt and drain the 529 accounts and do all those dramatic things that we hear about, um, because someone in your family, especially the breadwinner, has developed a serious illness. So I'd rather offer more and more important services to a broader range of people if I'm given that latitude by the federal government and by the lawmakers in Austin and with the dollars that were handed to do it. 